The 6 o'clock news starts right now. It has been almost six years since Sandra Bland died in the Waller County Jail after she was pulled over for a traffic violation. Bland's mother says her daughter died while fighting for racial justice and her work to help others must continue. So she took her cause to the Texas Capitol. Tiffany Huertas has more on a new nonprofit she's created to help families who have suffered a similar trauma. Today, several people gathered at the steps of the state's capital for the launch of the nonprofit, the Sandra Bland Center for Racial Justice. Sandra Bland's mother, Geneva Reed Veal, says the center was established to bring healing to families that have lost a loved one to police brutality and to help them navigate the criminal justice system. But we're trying to really assist families with being whole again. So we're doing scholarships. We're doing training. We're teaching financial literacy. Sandra Bland was found dead in a Waller County jail cell three days after her arrest. Her death was ruled a suicide. In 2017, the Sandra Bland Act passed. It mandates county jails divert people with mental health and substance abuse issues toward treatment. It also requires that independent law enforcement agencies investigate jail deaths. But Bland's mother says more needs to be done and the system remains broken. We had George Floyd, we had Breonna Taylor, we had so many after Sandy. This is after the Sandra Bland Act, okay, which they played with. They did not come back in and put the things in it that should be solid. They turned it into a mental health bill. Reedville hopes this new center helps many families. I just ask that those of you that are out here today who believe in Sandra's cause who believe that the Sandra Bland Center for Racial Justice will make drastic change in this world. Come on and join us. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. It has now been about 12 months since Americans and communities across the country marched to protest the killing of George Floyd by a Minnesota police officer. We saw a massive turnout right here in San Antonio. And in the time that has passed since then, there have been so many conversations about how to fight systemic racism and hold police accountable. It is the topic of this week's episode of KSAT Explains. In tomorrow's episode, we'll take a look at what's changed in the past year. Many people the KSAT Explains team talked to for this episode said a major change they've seen is more awareness about our country's history. I think we have a history of racism in our nation. Um, it doesn't mean that that has to be our future, but we have a history in which race has had an impact on people's ability to build wealth. It's had an impact on people's ability to live, to experience the American dream. KSAT Explains One Year Later is out tomorrow night. We'll be streaming the episode live on KSAT.com, on the KSAT TV app, on streaming devices, and KSAT's Facebook page that again starts at 7 p.m. Another mass shooting. That's what law enforcement agencies believe they prevented by arresting Coleman Thomas Blevins last week. The 28 year old was taken into custody Friday after Kirk County deputies intercepted a message the day before about plans threatening a Walmart. As Stephen Cavazos explained, swift action from multiple agencies helped put the man behind bars. If we weren't able to, something would have happened very soon. It was a message that led Kerr County deputies, the FBI, Department of Public Safety, and Secret Service to this man, 28-year-old Coleman Thomas Blevins, a man who calls himself a terrorist. Kerr County Sheriff Larry Letha says the investigation started a week prior to Blevins' arrest. My uh, Special Operation Division guys were contacted by the FBI and we provided some information on Mr. Blevins, at which time we started an uh, investigation. The sheriff says his deputies intercepted a message on social media from Blevins back on May 27th. According to Letha, the 28-year-old was planning a mass shooting at a Walmart. That's when law enforcement agencies moved in. We were able to get a search warrant, and arrest warrant, which we executed on Friday evening. Blevins was arrested in a parking lot over in the 1000 block of Junction Highway. He later confirmed he was affiliated and networking with, quote, extremist ideologies, end quote. Authorities seized firearms, ammunition, electronic evidence, concentrated THC from Blevins' apartment. They also found radical ideology paraphernalia, including books, flags, and handwritten documents. The sheriff relieved Blevins is in custody, but still worries what could have happened. Never think nothing will happen like this, but uh, really woke our eyes up, you know, here little Kerrville, Texas. Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News. 
Blevins is still in the Kerr County Jail tonight, booked on a $250,000 bond. Additional charges from the FBI and other federal authorities are still pending. The Texas legislature may have adjourned its 140 day session, but it still has some unfinished business, mainly SB 7. The voting overhaul bill was derailed after Texas House Democrats walked out breaking the quorum needed for a vote before the midnight deadline. In response, Governor Greg Abbott tweeted today, quote, no pay for those who abandon their responsibilities, end quote. He has vowed to defund the Texas legislature for the fiscal year starting September 1st. But Texas House Democrats said they had no other choice given the provisions that would make it harder to vote, but easier to overturn election results. You know, we're gonna rise up and fight uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the things we believe in, and the right to vote is something we believe in passionately. Similar voting restrictions already have been enacted elsewhere across the country. SB 7 is now one of Governor Greg Abbott's must-pass emergency items for a yet-to-be-scheduled special session. Supporters say they are confident it will pass, but if so, opponents say the law will very likely be challenged in the courts. Other top stories we're following today. A teen shot last night during a late night joy ride on a scooter. According to police, a teenager and his uncle were riding electric scooters downtown near East Martin and Soledad streets around two this morning when they heard a few pops. The teen originally thought he was hit by some glass, but he'd actually been shot in the leg. Police say someone drove by and fired a shot, but have no description of the car or suspect. The teen was taken to the hospital and is expected to be okay. Anyone with information is asked to contact police. Happening on the northwest side overnight, three family pets were rescued from a raging house fire. It was around 3.30 this morning when fire crews were called out to the home on Lynn's Grove and Capeswood Street, not far from I-10. When they arrived, the fat, they found the flame shooting through the roof of that two-story house. Investigators say the homeowners were staying at a hotel nearby because they knew that house had electrical problems. Firefighters were able to rescue their pets, but they had to be taken to an emergency veterinarian. So far, no word on their condition or what exactly caused that fire. Making headlines around Texas on this Memorial Day, one person is in custody after what some thought may have been an active shooter situation at a Dallas mall. Dallas police say it all started as a disturbance in the food court at North Park Mall up there. When officers confronted a group of people, a person reportedly threw a skateboard against the floor. Some people thought that sounded like gunshots and that caused a panic. No one was hurt. Authorities say despite there never being an actual threat, it was a scary situation for shoppers. Over to Houston now, investigators say a shooting at a nightclub overnight left two people dead and two others injured. Houston police say a man inside the club drew a gun and opened fire. One of several sheriff's deputies working off duty at the club returned to fire, possibly hitting the suspect. Four men were shot and again, two of them died. Police say one of the two killed may have been the shooter and surveillance video will help determine if that's the case. The other two victims were taken to the hospital. One is still in critical condition. On this Memorial Day, we pause to remember the lives of our servicemen and women who paid the ultimate sacrifice. We also keep another San Antonio service member in mind who witnessed the loss of so many of his brothers in Vietnam. Up until three weeks ago, he was the second oldest American prisoner of war that was still alive. Ursula Perry reports the recent passing of Colonel Gordon Larson should be honored as the loss of a bona fide hero whose story of sacrifice is part of history. The accolades of a war hero. Colonel Gordon Swede Larson was a bright shining star in the Air Force beginning after World War II. Tours as a bomber pilot in Germany, the U.S. and the Korean War readied him for training as a volunteer fighter pilot in Vietnam. But in 1967, on his 95th mission, he was shot down, suffered broken bones in the crash, was captured by the North Vietnamese, and then spent the next six years in a hell that became known as the Hanoi Hilton. What happened next, as seen in this POW Facebook page from a long ago interview, was cringeworthy. The first night in the main prison, they took me to... Uh, a press conference downtown. They gave me my flying suit to put on. And I remember uh, the press coming forward and taking pictures of my feet. And his body bloody, his back broken, 
But instead of medical care, he was tortured daily. Tie me up, bent over double. Uh, they'd pull the rope so tight that it cut off circulation. It uh, cut the tendons in both of my arms, uh, pulled the arm right out of the socket. His pictures that would circulate the world were intended to encourage the North Vietnamese Army and also to crush the morale of U.S. troops. I was in shock and in, in, in deep pain. Uh, I was just vaguely aware of where I was and, and who was out there in front of me. He would learn that if he was starved and weak, the photo ops would stop. But it was not until 1973, after many of his fellow service members died there, he was set free. He returned to the U.S. and settled in San Antonio. He suffered a long, painful life from serious injuries that he had suffered as a POW, but also was celebrated as a successful racehorse owner with many a win. His friends say his life was most amazing and he died at a ripe old age of 93. Colonel Larson will be laid to rest next week at Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery. He'll be remembered for all of his accomplishments, receiving the Silver Star for his leadership under fire, but also for all of the stories he told of the unity he felt with those men in the Hanoi Hilton at the brink of death and beyond. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. True American hero, thank you for your service, sir. Taking a live look at Trans Guy tonight, Loop 410 at San Pedro there, as you'd imagine, on this holiday. Pretty quiet out there, no trouble to report. We'll keep it that way. And taking a look at that live cam, a little bit gray out there, but we saw the sun for a lot of the day, Adam. Yeah, we, parts of the area saw a lot of sun temperatures spiked well into the 80s. Still not overly hot, though, out there. 85 was our high temperature here in San Antonio, and that's five degrees below average for this time of year. Taking a look at the radar, we don't have a whole lot of activity out there. Just a few highly isolated little brief pop-up showers that we're detecting. It's really not all that much to look at and to talk about. But as we go through the night, our rain and storm chances are going to increase. First, closer to the border, especially Valverde County, Maverick County. That would be about roughly between 8 and 10 p.m. And then closer to midnight, even here around San Antonio. We're going to talk more about this and our very active weather pattern coming right up, Tim. Thank you, Adam. Coming up at 6, a look at how Americans nationwide, including President Biden, are honoring the fallen this Memorial Day. Americans across the country taking time today to commemorate men and women in uniform who have paid the ultimate sacrifice. Speaking on his first Memorial Day as president, Joe Biden encouraged all Americans to fight for democracy. Daryl Forges reports. Present or as Americans remember the fallen, President Joe Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris, and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin spent the morning at Arlington National Cemetery, laying a wreath at the tomb of the unknown soldier. We're gathered at this sacred place in this solemn hour to engage in the most fundamental of undertakings, the right of remembrance. President Biden touched on this day impacting families across the country, including his own. Sunday marked the sixth anniversary of the death of his son, Bo, an Iraq War veteran. I always feel Bo close to me on Memorial Day. With Congress failing last week to create a bipartisan commission investigating the January 6th insurrection and many Republicans continuing to question the results of the presidential election, Biden warned that democracy itself is in peril. How we honor the memory of the fallen will determine whether or not democracy will long endure. And as he has many times during his presidency, call for unity on this solemn day. We must honor their sacrifice by sustaining the best of America, while honestly confronting all that we must do to make our nation fuller, freer, and more just. I'm Daryl Forges reporting. Well, it is not near as hot as we're used to on Memorial Day. We do have the rain to thank. Yeah, we have that. certainly seen warmer Memorial Days, Adam. Yeah. Well, we have, and uh, you know, often we equate Memorial Day weekend around here weather-wise with storms. I mean, so many historic and memorable storms, you know, that just happened to fall in or around Memorial Day. We started off Friday night, we had some, then we had some uh, pop-up ones through the weekend, and it looks like another round tonight. But this has been good in terms of, of course, the rainfall, the much needed rainfall. Let's start with this here. Of course, this is basically the end of the month right now and our month to date rainfall, 6.12 inches. That's 
about 1.7 inches above average. Now, since January 1st, this is good. I like this. We've had over 15 inches of precipitation, and that's 2.32 inches above average. And as I like to point out, notice how I say precipitation since January 1st because that takes into account the liquid equivalent of the February snow that we had. Here's a look at radar and I want to take a closer look at some of these showers here and you'll notice that we do have just a few little pop up showers. Not a big deal. Just a few little instability showers that have been developing Eastern Bear County crossing it to Guadalupe County. Not a big deal. Don't be surprised if you get caught under one of these little brief isolated showers or even sprinkles or parts of the north side of San Antonio. That's what we're seeing. Then you head out west and we've got some stronger thunderstorms just outside of our area that could be working their way into western Valverde County within the next 30 to 60 minutes. So that's what we're watching out there. Otherwise, severe thunderstorm watch not for our area, but locations just to the north and even northwest of us. And that's where we've been seeing the development and we're going to continue to watch for further development as we go through the evening. We're expecting one of those situations again where we get the leftovers of a thunderstorm complex and one's anticipated to come together just north of us and then push our way later this evening and tonight. I think this is a decently reliable computer model. It shows 10 o'clock, most of the action out west and then moving into the hill country. Locally in San Antonio, we really peak our rain chances, I think, between about 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. That's when we can expect some showers and thunderstorms and probably some heavy rainfall to move through. I think flash flooding is one of the primary concerns later on tonight as we are saturated, which is nice, but then you add more rainfall to it and it's like pouring water on concrete. It just quickly runs off and doesn't do you as many favors, of course, on the roadways. And then tomorrow, a few pop ups possible here and there. So let's talk about temperatures. 82 degrees right now. Dew point at 69, so feeling the humidity. Southeasterly wind at 16. In the 70s in the hill country, so definitely not a hot Memorial Day by Texas standards. 79 Bandera, 79 Comfort, 77 Bernie. 81 Canyon Lake, you get to 87 in Pleasanton and Divine at 84. And really, only 190 degree reading on the map here, and that's Catula at 90 degrees. Del Rio, you're at 88. So this evening, we'll see those increasing storm chances, especially around midnight here in San Antonio. Then tomorrow, we'll just have some isolated pop up showers and storms possible. So about a 30% chance, not as much coverage as what we're expecting tonight. We'll start the day tomorrow at 67, then top out at 84 degrees. Here's what happens the rest of the week, Wednesday all the way through Friday. So a good chunk of our week here. I'm anticipating those typical afternoon pop up random showers and thunderstorms, heavy rainfall with a little bit of lightning and thunder. So they'll be scattered in nature, mainly in the afternoons, Wednesday through Friday. They'll be hit or miss popping up randomly and likely just heavy rainfall with uh, the potential for some flash flooding, not really anticipating much or anything in terms of severe weather. Then and then we get into the weekend Saturday and the showers should be more numerous as an upper le level system takes over. So it's an active weather pattern. We're just going to keep tallying up the rainfall. I think Mother Nature just wants to keep you busy. All right, thanks, Adam. Thank you, Adam. All right, recently we've seen a lot of NBA fans behaving badly, and it happened again yesterday. That's right. We get, New York kind of lowered the bar with chanting to yes. be, get things off, and then Philly threw popcorn at Russell Westbrook, and that it seemed, it seemed like the only fans base was missing was Boston, and lo and behold, we have what happened last night with Kyrie Irving getting a water bottle thrown at his head. We come back, he will address the media and talk about that incident. Plus, Madison alumnus, Powers Arkansas baseball to a top seed in the upcoming NCAA tournament. Got that for you. Next. He quick pitched me, and I mean, in my head, I'm like, really, dude? I mean, it kind of made me mad, so I guess he hung a breaking ball, and I took my anger out on it. San Antonio native Jalen Battles powered Arkansas to their first SEC baseball title yesterday in big board sports. But first, let's head to Salem, Virginia. NCAA Division III softball championships featured a matchup of the last three champions. The defending champs TLU against two-time champs Virginia Wesley in game one this afternoon. And the Bulldogs dig themselves a bit of a hole. Bottom one, two on. Carly Fretz cranks one deep down the left field line and gone. A three-run homer gives the Marlins a 4-0 lead after one. But TLU answers in the very next half inning. Haley Padilla sends this two-run 
shot to left. And that does cut the lead in half, but that's as close as TLU would get. The Bulldogs fall in game one, four to two. So TLU will take the field tomorrow facing elimination. Game two is set for 10 a.m. Madison alumnus Jalen Battles made all kinds of plays throughout Arkansas baseball's run through the SEC tournament. And he had some standout moments in the Razorbacks 72 victory over Tennessee in the SEC title game yesterday afternoon. Not only did he finish three for four at the plate with a two RBI and two home, and excuse me, and that home run, he also made this spectacular diving stop on the bottom of the fourth. That actually made it on SportsCenter's top 10. For his performance, Battles was named tournament MVP, and now he leads Arkansas into the national tournament as the overall number one seed. I'm feeling, I'm feeling very confident. I mean, coming in, I talked to my uncle, and I mean, he gave me a lot of inspiration, you know, just getting my head right for it. But um, I'm very blessed to be the MVP. Arkansas will open double elimination regional tournament play this Friday. Their first game is against New Jersey Institute of Technology at home at 2 p.m. There has been plenty of off the court drama between fans and players during the first round of the NBA playoffs, but last night was arguably a new low as the Brooklyn Nets were leaving the court at TD Garden after their 141-126 victory over the Boston Celtics. Guard Kyrie Irving was nearly hit by a water bottle thrown from a fan in the stands. Irving and his teammates quickly identified the man who was arrested and escorted off the premises by police. That fan has since been banned for life. After the recent rash of behavior from fans across the NBA landscape, Irving says that might not be enough punishment. That people just feel very entitled out here. You know, they pay for the tickets, great. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that they're coming in to watch um, a great performance, but it, it's just, you know, we're not at the theater. We're not throwing tomatoes and, and other random stuff at the people that are performing. You know, it's just, it's too much. And it's a reflection on, um, you know, us as a whole when you have fans acting like that. So, you know, hopefully people learn their lessons from being banned for however many years of being arrested, but you know, there's always going to be an occasion. Brooklyn leads the series three games to one and will have a chance to close it out tomorrow night. 135,000 fans were witnesses to history yesterday. Elio Castroneves won the greatest spectacle in racing the Indianapolis 500, becoming the fourth man ever to win four career Indy 500 titles. And afterward, he climbed the fence in a legendary celebration at just 46 years young. I never stopped dreaming. I never stopped believing it, and uh, I'm so glad I uh, I I did that because I want to want to know those young kids that sometimes they think it's hard work doesn't pay off. It just is just a, a proof that you still can believe in yourself and to make yourself better. San Antonio resident Pato Award led the Indy 500 multiple times and finished fourth overall, a personal best. Afterward, he said he was close, but he was still proud of his performance. A lot to take away from yesterday. Yeah, nice finish for him and a nice correction on uh, 46 years young. I'm not calling it a correction. I'm just making you feel better. That's all it is. If you were with us yesterday, it was a hoot. <laughs> Thanks for making me feel better about being 46. You're welcome. You're so young. <laughs> we'll be right back. This weekend marking a century since the Tulsa race massacre as the community comes together to pay respects to the victims and to heal. We are seeing differences in opinion over how to handle the commemoration and reparations. ABC's Alex Perche has more from Washington. A century after the destruction, the city of Tulsa is yearning for answers and accountability for a ruthless attack on the community of Greenwood, also known as Black Wall Street. In 1921, a mob of armed white men burned down this thriving hub of black owned businesses. Untold amounts of generational wealth wiped out within 24 hours. The attack left 300 black Americans dead. It's finally being acknowledged uh, what our ancestors went through. What do we want? Yeah. Many people traveled over the weekend to visit this hollowed ground. Stand up, stand tall. More today. To the people of Tulsa, we see you. And even more scheduled to visit tomorrow, including President Biden who's calling on Americans to reflect on the deep root of racial terror and recommit to the work of rooting out systemic racism across our country. He'll meet with surviving members of the community like Viola Fletcher. I hear the screams. I have lived through the massacre every day. 
Ms. Fletcher testified in front of Congress this month as part of a lawsuit against the city of Tulsa and others for the estimated $1.8 million in property loss claims back then. No one was ever punished or held accountable for the massacre, stemming from allegations that were never proven that a black man assaulted a white woman in an elevator. The survivors never received any type of reparations. Uh, they never received any type of benefit. Senator Chris Kuhn saying their actions are responsible for the nationwide attention today. This whole country is focused today on what happened here a century ago, and you have made that happen. President Biden said the attack on Greenwood persisted across generations and that the federal government must reckon and acknowledge the role it's played in taking opportunities and wealth from black communities. Alex Perche, ABC News, Washington. News around America, a birthday concert for a local rapper in Miami turned into the country's latest mass shooting. As families grieve, Miami police are on the hunt for several suspects. New surveillance video shows three people armed with rifles and handguns getting out of a vehicle before opening fire at a crowd earlier early Sunday morning, leaving two people dead and at least 20 injured. Authorities say those suspects waited more than 30 minutes to attack the people leaving the concert. Police believe gunfire was also returned as about 100 shell casings were found at the scene. I can tell you that there is no fear that is greater for any person living in these communities than the fear of being gunned down in a community when all they're doing is trying to live their daily life. This latest rampage is one of at least 68 mass shootings in this country in May alone. That's according to the Gun Violence Archive. It's also the second one in the Miami area since the start of Memorial Day weekend. The owners of a Nashville hat store are apologizing after offering the sale of Yellow Star of David badges, which read, not vaccinated. The owner of Hatworks posted to Instagram saying the move was not meant to, quote, trivialize, trivialize the Star of David or disrespect what happened to millions of people, end quote. The not vaccinated badges sparked demonstrators to gather outside the store over the weekend with signs like Nashville condemns Hatworks. Western apparel maker Stetson announced it was cutting ties with the retailer. At least four other companies have done the same. Hatworks has removed its post about the patches and says it has no plan to sell them or give them away. A former Southwest Airlines pilot has been sentenced to a year of probation after pleading guilty to committing a lewd act during a flight that he was piloting. That's according to a release from the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Maryland. 60-year-old Michael Hack was sentenced last week. The incident occurred last summer, though. Hack admitted that once the plane reached cruising altitude, he got out of the pilot's seat undressed and watched porn on a laptop. The judge ordered Hack to pay a $5,000 fine. No comment was available from Hack or his lawyers. Southwest says Hack left the airline before the incident was reported. The 2021 hurricane season begins tomorrow, and experts say it looks like it may be a very busy year. The season runs through November 30th. The Colorado State University Tropical Meteorology Project team is predicting an above-average season. They're forecasting 17 named storms, including eight hurricanes. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Climate Prediction Center is forecasting a 60% chance for an above-normal season. Turning now to coronavirus and the crisis in India. Following weeks of record case numbers there, we are finally seeing some signs of improvement. The country reported on Monday its lowest number of cases and deaths since April 11th. Nearly 153,000 new infections were recorded as the total case numbers have now surpassed 28 million. It's the fourth day in a row that the number was below 200,000. Although reported cases are declining, state authorities remain cautious. Some states have extended lockdowns. The country says it hopes to deliver 120 million doses of COVID vaccines in June. Still ahead at six, it's a real thing. Get paid to play video games. How you and your friends can make some serious cash. Plus, an honest mistake leads to a major payoff for a woman who was late to buy her lottery ticket. Those stories and more coming up in The Buzz. Well, there is more encouraging news for pregnant women hesitant about getting the COVID-19 vaccine. A new study shows the vaccine had no effect on the placentas of women who got the vaccine. I spoke to a specialist about why studying the placenta is such a key part of understanding pregnancy safety. Seeing that there were no changes and no inflammation and no damage to the placenta just makes us feel even better that 
we feel that this is a safe vaccine. The American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and doctors across the globe recommend the COVID vaccine for all pregnant women. And a new study out of Chicago is helping support that recommendation. After delivery, they looked at the placenta under a microscope to see if there's any evidence of inflammation or any kind of damage that could have occurred because of the vaccination. Dr. Shad Deering heads the maternal fetal medicine department at the Children's Hospital of San Antonio. In looking at the study, which compared women who did and did not get the vaccine Vaccine. It's the study of the placenta that is a real game changer when it comes to pregnancy safety. The placenta is an organ right here that develops around your baby inside the uterus when you're pregnant. It delivers oxygen and nutrients to the baby, but also can remove waste from its blood. It's really everything to the baby. Um, it's the interface that protects the baby. Uh, it's the interface that feeds the baby. The women from this study were mainly in their third trimester and Deering looks forward to future studies with more women who got the vaccine in the first and second trimesters. And having you know seen women who were affected with COVID and who got really sick, I mean, we're really excited about the opportunity to treat with a vaccine. Still, he understands women's hesitancy in getting a new vaccine. Talk with your physician about it. Um, ask the questions. It's OK to have questions. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. To find more stories about pregnancy during the pandemic, including several others I've done specifically on vaccine safety, you can head to ksat.com and click on the parenting section. Take a live look outside, see some clouds out there. We are awaiting some rain. Not exactly right now. Perhaps later in the evening we could see some storms roll through. Adam? Yeah, most of the action should be later on. Right now we have a few pop-up little showers here and there. We'll take a closer look at those on the radar in just a moment. But notice how our storm chances really increase as we go through the night. Only about a 20% chance basically right now through 8 o'clock because a few hit or miss isolated showers are developing. And we get closer to midnight and we're up to about 60%. Temperature wise will be falling down into the 70s. We're going to talk more about those storms, show you the future cast, help time it out for you and talk about an active week coming right up. All right, check this out. Experts say today could be the busiest day at America's airports during the pandemic. The TSA reported screening more than 7 million people between Thursday and Sunday. On Sunday alone, 1.65 million travelers went through TSA screening. Sundays are usually the biggest travel day of the year, but today is a holiday. Experts say Memorial Day should cap off a record weekend of holiday travel and kick off a busy start to the summer. All right, if someone told you you could earn money playing video games, but you had to play for 21 hours, who would you do it? And you can only pick one friend. Who would it be? The Frontier, but I, I mean, I don't play video games, but I know that I would pick two people who are currently <laughs> in our control room right now. Frontier Bundles is an internet provider is offering $2,000 to two pals willing to play 21 hours of video games together and report back on their experience. The company wants to know if people do better playing solo or with someone on their side. Does this come with free Red Bull? <laughs> it's a fun way to celebrate some big game anniversaries this year. Donkey Kong is turning 40 and The Legend of Zelda is turning 35. Mm -hmm. Sonic the Hedgehog and Street Fighter 2 will both turn 30 as well. If you want to win two grand while you game. There's more information on the Frontier Bundles website. Have fun. Be careful. Sonic is 30. Yeah. Speaking of earning money, a North Carolina woman's mistake led to a big payoff. Elizabeth Johnson won $2 million after buying a lottery ticket for a drawing she was not even trying to enter. She says she rushed to get her numbers into a Powerball drawing last week, but missed the cutoff by one minute to buy a ticket with online play. However, Johnson's quick pick ticket was good for the drawing three days later, which earned her a $2 million prize. She says she was surprised when she found out she won because she thought she didn't play that particular mm -hmm. night. After taxes, Johnson's payout comes to $1.4 million. She plans to buy a house and take her kids where else but Disneyland. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. Well, if you're looking to fly anywhere soon, you should know American Airlines says it will not resume alcohol sales in its main cabin until September. Passengers will have to wait until September 13th to order a mid-flight drink. That coincides with the end of Transportation Security Administration's mask mandate for all planes. Yeah, it also has a lot to do with people behaving badly on planes because <laughs> the decision extended the alcohol ban following a recent assault of a Southwest flight 
flight attendant that resulted in serious injuries. American Airlines first suspended alcohol sales in the main cabins in March of 2020 to limit interaction between crew and passengers. The airline now says alcohol will continue to be offered in first and business class cabins, but only in flight because, you know, they can behave themselves apparently more than the folks back in coach. Everybody calm down. <laughs> Seriously. It's going to be okay. <laughs> Chill out. Well, the weather has chilled out. Yes. And actually chillier than usual, which is my favorite part of this uh, <laughs> weather situation for Memorial Day today, is that it's not, you know, 100 degrees already. Yeah, but we do have the traditional stormy yes. weather. Yeah, we do. That is tradition around here, and uh, this year is no exception. We started it off Friday night with 70 plus mile per hour gusts at the airport. Then we had a few pop up, just garden variety showers and thunderstorms through the weekend. Tonight, I think we'll have another round. We've got some storm chances into the night, and an overall an active weather pattern is going to remain in place. So get used to sporadic storm chances every day going forward all the way through next weekend. One good side effect is the aquifer is up over 20 feet since April 21st. How is how nice is that? That's a stat we love. All right, take a look at this. Of course, we're winding down May now. We've had 6.12 inches of rain. We talked about that earlier in the newscast, and that's 1.7 inches above average. And you look at all the days where we had at least a trace of rain, and that's the majority of the month, about two thirds of the month. You factor in the last few days of April, and we've had a total of 11.29 inches of rainfall. Speaking of rain, let's look at the radar now. We've got some activity approaching Luling on the radar. This is brief, very isolated pop up kind of instability showers that we're seeing out there. A little bit past just west of Marion and now even New Braunfels, especially the west side of New Braunfels and Green getting clipped by it. Up closer to Blanco as, or into Blanco County near Johnson City as well. Sisterdale area just east of Comfort has a few little spotty showers. No lightning being detected with any of these. They're just run of the mill garden variety little pop up showers. Some wet roads, but happy lawns and gardens and around Real County. What we're really watching is some rowdy thunderstorms that are pushing toward western Valverde County. We're going to keep an eye on those and see how they uh, how they act once they get closer to our area and some folks in Valverde County because we could see that severe weather just expanded eastward into Valverde County. Luckily, that's a fairly uh, sparsely populated area, but there are some folks out there and we'll keep you updated on that situation. Severe thunderstorm watch not for us, but these yellow locations to the north and northwest. That's where we've already had a lot of activity and we're expecting further development. That's the thing. Tonight's one of those nights where we're expecting the leftovers of a thunderstorm complex to move into town and some organization outside of our neck of the woods would then move our way. Here's one computer rendition of it. And I think this is one of the more reliable computer models over the past week or so. And it shows, you know, nine, 10 o'clock, some action Valverde County. Obviously it's could be sooner than that. We already have that storm approaching Valverde County, two of them actually, but nonetheless organizes some activity closer to midnight. That's when it's moving through the hill country and then anywhere from about 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. I think is when we could expect the maximum rain chances around San Antonio. And then by sunrise it all moves east. It's all out of here and starts to fizzle away. So in terms of the timeline for you, we've got those rain chances up to 60 percent midnight and then even to 3 a.m. 4 a.m. and later those rain chances and storm chances fall off. Yes, there is a potential for severe weather, uh, especially in the hill country and closer to the Rio Grande. But overall, we're expecting more heavy rain than anything with this and the potential for some flash flooding. Kerrville 77, only 78 in Fredericksburg, 90 in Catula, but that's an outlier. Pleasanton's 85, 82 here in town. And through the evening, we'll see those temperatures fall off through the 70s. Tomorrow morning, 67 to start. 85 in the afternoon, minimal breeze, mostly cloudy at a 30% chance, but then daily Wednesday through Friday, those afternoon pop up showers and storms, random in nature, Saturday a little more organized, so higher rain chances at that point. Guess I'm going to have to be careful on how I plan my next four days off. Yes, you deserve them though. Yeah. <laughs> All right, in case you missed it, it's coming up next. Stay with us. Good morning. It is Monday, May 31st. It is Memorial Day. Thank you so much for starting your morning with us. An emotional Johnny Silva honors his ultimate heroes, including his father. It's about the people who sacrifice their life for our freedom. It's not about barbecuing. It's about family, you know, sacrifice. 
and I'd buy the sale. I hear him honk, I hear him, you know, give me the thanks, you know. I give them the thanks, all our veterans, you know, those that, you know, are here. Texas House Democrats, including those from Bear County, say they had no choice but to walk out to keep new voting restrictions from reaching the governor's desk. This was a show of strength. We may be, we may not have the numbers in the House, but we are a force to be reckoned with. Walking out was the only tool that we had left in our toolbox, and we took advantage of it. But five, a man is in jail after he led Bear County Sheriff's deputies on a short chase this morning. The sheriff's office says deputies were watching Brandon Jamal Miller. They say the deputy attempted to pull Miller over and he refused to stop for them. The chase then ensued and at one point Miller threw a gun out the window. Americans are hitting the roads and air this Memorial Day weekend as travelers feel more confident with coronavirus cases on a downward trend. For the first time in over a year, the U.S. is now averaging less than 20,000 new COVID cases a day. National daily average case numbers plunging nearly 70% in the past six weeks, with more than 50% of American adults fully vaccinated. So storms likely later tonight, especially around and even after midnight. Then we get into tomorrow, maybe a stray pop-up or two, isolated in nature. It's Wednesday through Friday where we're expecting those daily pop-up afternoon showers, slow moving, some heavy rain, little bit of lightning and thunder with them. So an active pattern, but it does, that doesn't mean it's going to be raining all day every day. We'll just have our moments here and there, especially into the weekend. All right. Thank you, Adam, and thank you for watching. We'll see you tonight on the Night Beat.